In 2013, Jessica Haringer, a 25-year-old woman, disappeared under circumstances from her workplace. The search for her kidnapper spanned several years, during which numerous other women were affected. When the authorities finally apprehended the culprit by chance, they uncovered deeply disturbing details about him. Jessica Haringer was born on July 16, 1987, and resided in Norton Shores, Michigan. She grew up in a modest family with a sister. At 22, Jessica became a mother to a son named Zine, fathered by her long-term partner Dakota Quayle Dyer. They were still together in 2013, living in a leased home. At the age of 25, Jessica worked at an Exxon gas station in Norton Shores, located near Lake Michigan. Known for her warm and friendly nature as a manager, she often received praise from customers. To support her cherished three-year-old son, she frequently took on extra hours. Jessica's diary highlighted her ambitions to learn and advance. She aspired to pursue college studies in accounting, but financial constraints hindered this goal. Dakota was unable to fully support their family, leading to frequent disputes and turmoil in their relationship. The couple was engaged, yet their marriage faced repeated delays due to various factors. On the evening of April 26, 2013, Jessica Haringer was carrying out her regular duties at the Exxon gas station. Her day began with a visit to a nearby store around 3 p.m., followed by a drive to her workplace. She arrived at the gas station around 4.35 p.m., parked her car and started her night shift, which was supposed to end at 11.30 p.m. Jessica was the sole employee on duty that night. At 11.14 p.m., a customer called Emergency Services reporting his experience at the Exxon station. He had entered the store to pay for his gas in cash but found it unattended. He informed the dispatcher, I'm not sure what's going on, but there's no one at the station. The door is open and unlocked. Lights are still on, but there's no one to take my payment. There are just my car and another vehicle outside. Why isn't anyone here? It looks very odd. The police reached the Exxon gas station within 10 minutes of the 901 call. During their inspection of the premises, both inside and outside, they found no evidence of a struggle. Everything seemed orderly. Jessica's coat was in the back room, along with her purse containing $400, car and house keys. A solitary drop of blood, later identified as Jessica's, was discovered near the storage area's back door. Additionally, a cap from a Walther P-22 semi-automatic pistol's laser sight and two batteries, likely for a watch, were found on the floor. The gas station's cash register remained undisturbed with all the money intact. The last recorded transaction was at 10.52 p.m. for a lighter. The facility lacked interior surveillance cameras. Positioned next to the cash register was Jessica's pack of cigarettes, suggesting she had briefly left her station with the intention of returning soon. Her locked car was parked outside, but Jessica was nowhere to be seen. She had inexplicably disappeared. Upon discovering the station unattended, police reached out to the gas station's owner, informing them of the situation. The owner subsequently contacted another manager living close by, requesting her to secure the premises Additionally, the police notified Jessica's family of her disappearance. Her parents sought clues to her whereabouts and called her friends. One friend recalled being at the gas station between 8 and 9 p.m. that day, noting that all appeared normal then. Shortly after, a fellow employee arrived to lock up the station. This colleague recounted that around 11 p.m., she and her boyfriend had driven by the station on a motorcycle they spotted a silver Chrysler Town & Country minivan parked near the rear service door with its back door open. Suspecting Jessica might be involved in theft from the station, they paused to observe further developments. The manager observed a young man with disheveled wavy hair near the minivan, dressed in an orange sweatshirt. She saw him repeatedly open and close the vehicle's rear door before he finally drove off. Police reviewing surveillance footage from surrounding buildings located a video showing a silver Chrysler passing by Exxon gas station at 11.02 p.m. A store employee nearby also spoke to the police, mentioning that he had seen the man in the minivan conversing with Jessica Christian. 
the employee initially thought the stranger was merely flirting with Jessica, given her attractiveness. He noted Jessica standing outside, while the man questioned why she wasn't inside. Both Christian and Jessica's colleague, who had spotted the man by the minivan, contributed to creating a composite sketch of the unidentified individual. He was depicted as a light-complexioned young male with dark wavy hair, a stocky build, and approximately 1.82 meters in height. The sketch was released three days following Jessica's disappearance. Despite numerous calls received by police in response, no significant leads emerged from the information provided. The prevalence of the silver Chrysler minivan in the United States posed a considerable obstacle in the investigation. In Michigan alone, there were approximately 15,000 vehicles of this kind registered. Identifying the specific driver of the minivan linked to Jessica Hinger's disappearance became a daunting challenge given the vast number of identical models. Initially, Jessica's boyfriend Dakota Quail D was a suspect in her disappearance. He acknowledged their frequent arguments, but denied ever physically harming her. Dakota actively cooperated with the investigation, informing police that he was at home with their three-year-old son on the night Jessica vanished. Without access to a car, he couldn't have traveled to her workplace and his phone records, once verified by detectives, confirmed his presence at home that evening. This led to his exclusion from the suspect list. The investigation revealed that Jessica had numerous admirers due to her amiable and outgoing personality, which sometimes led to misunderstandings. One such admirer was Jess Ammerman, a 37-year-old married plumber. He visited Jessica at the gas station around 9.30 p.m. on the day she disappeared and confessed his love and willingness to divorce his wife for her. However, Jessica rebuffed his advances. Jess then left the station and called his wife. They spoke for about 50 minutes before he returned home. Following his interrogation, a polygraph test, and an interview with his wife, Jess Ammerman was also eliminated as a suspect. Rob Fallett, the brother of the Exxon gas station's manager, subsequently emerged as another individual involved in this case, though context-wise specifics about Rob's involvement were not provided. Identified as the next suspect, he mentioned visiting the gas station around 9 p.m. on the day Jessica disappeared. Upon greeting her, he noticed she seemed downcast. Asking about her mood, Jessica confided in having family troubles. Rob suggested she could stay with him, but she declined. After a short while at the station and making a purchase, Rob left for a night fishing trip at the lake. Detectives checked Rob's phone records for that evening which corroborated his account of leaving the gas station for fishing. Consequently, Rob Fillet was eliminated from the suspect list. Search and rescue operations for Jessica Hearinger were launched using helicopters, expertly trained canines, and extensive searches of residential and commercial properties, woods, and Lake Michigan. Despite these exhaustive efforts, no leads were found, leading to an impasse in the case. Nearly a year later, in February 2014, a similar event occurred in Michigan. A small blonde, bespectacled woman was assaulted by a man while returning home late at night. She was kidnapped, taken to his apartment, and attacked. Despite threats to her life, she was released after several hours. The perpetrator was identified as 42-year-old Brad Allen Mason. Mason was swiftly located, but resisted arrest by brandishing a fake firearm at police officers resulting in his fatal shooting. Mason had a history of criminal activity, including a 2004 kidnapping conviction and a 2011 arrest for indecent exposure. In 2014, he resided in a dormitory opposite the Exxon gas station where Jessica worked. However, investigators found no evidence linking Mason to Jessica's disappearance. Two years after Jessica Hearinger's disappearance, in 2016 another incident involving a young woman occurred late at night. Returning from a party at a friend's house, she became disoriented on a dark street. A man in a silver minivan approached her asking if she was okay and offering her a ride. She refused, but requested to use his phone instead. The man consented, but only if she entered the minivan. Once inside, he locked the door and revealed his phone battery was dead, then brandished a gun, 
instructing her to stay silent. These cases highlight ongoing challenges faced by law enforcement in solving abduction instances, despite rigorous investigative efforts and community cooperation. He then began driving, feeling sick and nauseated. The woman requested him to lower the window. Seizing the opportunity, she leaped out of the moving vehicle through the window and fled to a nearby house. The man sped away. The victim immediately contacted the police and described kidnapper. Through surveillance footage, the police managed to trace the license plate of the Silver Chrysler town and country. They identified the driver as 46-year-old Jeffrey Willis. Jeffrey Willis, a factory laborer, led a secluded, modest life and had no prior legal issues. When located in his minivan, police searched and found a Walther P-22 semi-automatic pistol. The gun was traced back to a colleague of Jeff, who had reported her laser-sighted gun stolen some time ago. Willis was arrested and detained. A search of his residence uncovered a box filled with various BDSM paraphernalia, including handcuffs, chains, ropes, gags, a vibrator, a video camera, and a bullet matching a Walther P-22. The box also contained insulin syringes with an unidentified liquid, sedatives, Viagra, lubricant, disposable gloves, and a diagram of a woman's anatomy with marked injection sites. On his computer were numerous videos depicting appalling kidnapping scenes with young women as victims. A hidden hard drive in a ventilation duct contained footage Willis had recorded of his female neighbors swimming without their knowledge. A folder titled Victims on the computer held two subfolders, one named for the missing Jessica Haringa and another for a murdered woman named Rebecca. Rebecca Bletch, aged 36, was tragically murdered on June 29, 2014, roughly a year after Jessica Herringer vanished in an area just 20 minutes from where Jessica worked at the Exxon gas station. Rebecca went out for an evening run, but never made it back home. She was found by neighbors lying on the road with her clothing disheveled, initially leading to the belief that she was struck by a car, although unconscious. Rebecca still had a pulse when discovered. Emergency services were called, but she succumbed to her injuries before they could save her. Autopsy reports revealed she died from three gunshot wounds to her back and head with multiple bruises on her wrists and legs. At the time of her death, the perpetrator remained at large. However, two years after Jeffrey Willis's arrest, new evidence linked Rebecca's murder to a pistol found in Willis's minivan. Willis denied any involvement, but prosecutors theorized that he had attempted to abduct Rebecca and bring her to his home. When Rebecca resisted, Willis reportedly shot her and fled. Forensic analysis later discovered Rebecca's DNA on a glove recovered from Willis's residence. Jeffrey Willis was convicted of Rebecca Bletch's murder and received a life sentence. While serving his sentence, he faced additional charges related to the kidnapping of Jessica Hearinger. Despite consistently denying any involvement in Jessica's disappearance, phone records showed that on the night she vanished, he was present at the Exxon gas station where she was last seen. Subsequently, he traveled to his deceased grandfather's house, which is roughly 13 minutes from the station. Upon arriving at his grandfather's residence, police encountered a heavily secured front door. Forced entry revealed an assortment of cleaning products, powders and bleaches, in the basement. The manufacturing dates on these items aligned with early 2013, matching the time frame of Jessica's disappearance. Colleagues recalled that Jeffrey Willis was notably absent on April 27, 2013, the day following Jessica hearing his disappearance. When he returned to work a few days later, he had conspicuous deep scratches on his face and hands, raising further suspicions among those who knew him a woman who visited the gas station on April 25th, the day before Jessica's disappearance, later contacted police. She arrived late in the evening and expressed concern about being there alone at such an hour to Jessica herself. Jessica nodded in acknowledgement, appearing anxious and somewhat scared. At that moment, an unknown man inside the station reassured the visitor by saying, don't worry, she has customers who look after her. He left the premises. The concerned visitor, still worried about Jessica's safety, stayed in her car outside until Jessica finished her shift and headed home. Tragically, 
Jessica disappeared the following day in 2016. The witness from the gas station positively identified Jeffrey Willis, recalling seeing him there. Investigators learned that Willis had frequented the Exxon gas station, interacting with Jessica Haringer on at least 15 occasions. Concurrently, 48-year-old Kevin Bloom, Willis's cousin and a prison guard, was taken into custody. Kevin's inconsistent statements during interrogation eventually led to a confession. He disclosed information about Rebecca Bletcher's death that hadn't been publicly known. Kevin also confessed to assisting Jeffrey in concealing Jessica's body. He described how on April 27th, the day after Jessica's abduction, Jeffrey invited him over for a party at his house. Upon arriving at his late grandfather's residence, Kevin saw Jessica for the first time lying on the floor bound and lifeless. The cousins wrapped her body in a sheet, transported it in a car to a forest where Jeffrey had pre-dug a grave and buried her. They then returned home. When Kevin Bloom led the police to the forest to identify the burial site of Jessica Herringer's body, he spent a considerable amount of time wandering through the area. Despite his efforts, he was unable to pinpoint the precise location where they had buried the body. The trial of Jeffrey Willis commenced despite Jessica Herringer's body not being found either alive or deceased. The prosecution presented substantial evidence to charge Willis with her kidnapping and murder. Their case posited that Willis had been stalking Jessica for an extended period. On the night of April 26, 2013, he allegedly parked his vehicle near the service entrance of the gas station. Entering the premises, he is said to have struck Jessica on the head with his gun. During this assault, it's reported that the cover of the gun's laser sight fell off and Jessica's blood was spilled on the floor. Willis then purportedly dragged Jessica out through the service exit and placed her in the back seat of his car. He transported her to his late grandfather's house where he committed his most horrific acts. Forensic computer analysis revealed that Jeffrey Willis stored photographs and news articles about the search for Jessica on his computer. Following the investigation's progress, it was discovered Willis used a password displayed on the screen consisting of Jessica's initials and the date April 27, 2013, presumed to be the day she died. Willis consistently denied his guilt, insisting he was at home on the night of her kidnapping. His lawyers argued that there was no direct evidence linking him to the case. No DNA belonging to Jessica was found in Willis's house or car. The defense team suggested that her disappearance might be linked to illegal drug trafficking, since Dakota had mentioned Jessica developed a serious substance abuse problem. Despite these arguments, Jeffrey Willis was convicted of murdering Jessica Hearinger and received a life sentence without parole. Throughout the trial, he displayed neither remorse nor empathy. His cousin, Kevin Bloom, was found guilty of assisting in disposing of Jessica's body. Kevin received a sentence of two years in prison and five years probation. Suspension from his role in the prison system was yet another blow to Jeffrey Willis. Years after his conviction, the narrative around him took a startling twist. He became a suspect in an older, unresolved case. On October 17, 1996, in Fruitport, Michigan, Angela Thorberg, a young woman, was found dead. Her remained at large. Ed Willis, who graduated from the same high school as Angela in 1988, found himself linked to her 1996 murder. In that year, 28-year-old Willis worked as a janitor at his alma mater. Concerns were raised when the principal noticed his excessive time spent in the computer lab during work hours. A check on his computer activities was initiated by the principal. Although the findings remain undisclosed, Willis was asked to resign immediately following the review. The investigation into Angela's murder continues to be shrouded in secrecy. A decade has passed since Jessica Hearinger's disappearance and her remains are still undiscovered. This tragedy sparked a legal battle over the custody of her son Zan between Jessica's sister and Dakota, her partner. Ultimately, Jessica's biological family is raising Zan. In addition to custody disputes, Jessica's parents have been key advocates for legislative changes following their daughter's disappearance. 
Their efforts led to the enactment of a law mandating gas stations operating at night to install surveillance cameras. The goal is to prevent similar incidents in the future. On December 20, 2017, a press conference was held during which Mark Perez, special agent in charge of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, announced a breakthrough in the disappearance of Mike Williams, a Tallahassee real estate appraiser who was originally presumed to have drowned while duck hunting on Lake Seminole on December 16, 2000, and was eaten by alligators. Being here now, I can tell you what happened to Mike Williams, Perez said. Mike Williams did not drown in the lake. He wasn't eaten by alligators. He didn't leave town and leave his wife and 18-month-old daughter behind. He was murdered. In the interest of the investigation, we cannot yet release details, but I am happy to report that this morning investigators notified the Williams family of recent discoveries in the case. Today's story is not only about love, betrayal, infidelity, and greed, but also about a mother's resilience. For 17 years and four days, Cheryl Williams, Mike's mom, disagreed that her son had drowned in Lake Seminole and pushed with tenacity for law enforcement to investigate her son's disappearance. She believed with all her heart that those responsible would be punished, believed even when no one else did. I had two choices. He was alive or dead. I chose to believe he was alive, and I really think that's what helped me, Cheryl said on December 20th, 2017. A lot of people called me crazy, but if I had given up, we never would have found him. The day before the press conference, Brian Winchester, a close friend of Mike and his wife Denise, who later married Brian, was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Mike's mother was right. Retribution came to those responsible, and ironically, they were the cause of the truth coming out. In 2000, Brian and Denise's affair, which began in 1997, turned into a murder. And years later, they went from lovers to strangers who didn't trust each other. Brian was very afraid that after the divorce, Denise would inform the police about what had happened to Mike, so he attacked her. Denise, on the other hand, went to great lengths to get him a life sentence. She was very persuasive in asking the jury for the maximum sentence, and it was these efforts that led to Brian having nothing to lose, and he made a deal with the prosecutor. Brian was sentenced to 20 years in 2017 for the kidnapping of Denise Williams, but he avoided a life sentence. Denise was celebrating the victory and was unaware that the conviction was part of a deal in which Brian Winchester, 49, admitted to planning the murder and a 17-year cover-up of the murder and received immunity from any prosecution for his role in the case. In exchange, he led investigators to Mike's body and gave a full and truthful confession. It would only be a few months later, and on May 8, 2018, Denise Williams would be arrested. At first glance, things are a little confusing, aren't they? Let's break down this case in detail. Jerry Michael Williams was born on October 16, 1969, in Bradfordville, north of Tallahassee, the son of a bus driver and a kindergarten teacher. Family and friends called him Mike. Even though the family didn't have much money, and the boy, along with his older brother, grew up living in a trailer, those were happy times. The parents cared about their son's future, and instead of building a house, they set aside money for the education of both boys, who themselves worked part-time at night in supermarkets. The sons enrolled in North Florida Christian High School. There, Mike excelled. He became student council president, played soccer, and was active in the key club. At the age of 15, Mike started duck hunting as a hobby and met Denise Merrill. The young lad was a soccer player and student council president. Denise was a cheerleader and council secretary and they began dating. Friends thought they were a great couple. While still in high school, Mike became best friends with Brian Winchester, whom Denise introduced him to. Brian later had a friend, Katie Thomas, and the two couples remained friends for the rest of Mike's life. After high school, Mike attended Florida State University where he majored in political science and urban planning. The lovers graduated together. Denise became a public accountant. Mike became a real estate appraiser. Mike proved to be a valuable worker. He often worked 15 hours a day, and of course his career took off. In 1994, the young successful man married Denise. It was around this time that Brian married Kathy as well. All four of them continued to stay in close contact. Mike loved his wife dearly, 
strived to provide for their family as best he could and had incredible energy. At the age of 31, Mike Williams achieved considerable success. As a real estate appraiser, he was earning nearly $200,000 a year. The couple was able to afford a home in a small upscale neighborhood on the east side of town and in 1999 became happy parents. They had a daughter whom the couple named Ansley. Mike's friends told me that he was always prudent. Since the young man was engaged in quite risky activities, he wanted to be sure that in case of disaster, his family would definitely be taken care of. Not surprisingly, Mike turned to his best friend who was working as an insurance agent at the time. Ryan sold him two insurance policies for $250,000 and later for $500,000. In 2000, Mike's father passed away. Williams was so stunned by this suddenness that, wanting to financially secure his own family, he again turned to a friend. Brian helped Mike to insure his life for $1 million. Thus, about six months before his disappearance, the life of the loving father of the family was insured for almost $2 million. According to Denise, on the morning of December 16, 2000, her husband woke up early to go duck hunting on Lake Seminole, a large reservoir connected to the Apalachicola River. It was the day of their sixth wedding anniversary, and the couple planned to celebrate the date at night in Apalachicola, a small town on the bayou. The wife and daughter waited for Mike at home at noon, but he never returned. Naturally, Denise became concerned and called her father, who in turn called Mike's best friend, Brian Winchester. Together with his father, Brian drove to Lake Seminole. There they found Mike's Ford Bronco car near the boat dock, but Mike himself was nowhere to be found. The men went around to all the places Mike liked to hunt, but couldn't even find the boat. So they decided to call the police. After investigators from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency were called, the search for Mike began. A few hours later, a helicopter pilot found the boat drifting about 225 feet from the boat ramp. A search of the boat turned up Mike's shotgun, still in its case. Apparently, he never got to use it. The search became a rescue operation. Locals believed that before the three rivers were dammed to form the lake, the reservoir was the site of an orchard. Thus, the lake got its name Stump Field, due to the many remaining stumps that protruded above and below the water level, requiring careful handling of any motorized boat in the area. Because of this, searchers speculated that Williams hit a stump on his boat, fell out, and submerged himself in the water. His wading boots filled with water, and he probably drowned when he couldn't get out. Several other agencies were called in to help, including a dive team from Montgomery, Alabama, and the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. But the extensive and methodical search yielded nothing. Mike was never located. A week passed and the rescue operation turned into a body search operation. Teams were given probe holes to probe the bottom of the lake and dogs were brought to the site. Ten days into the search, volunteers found the camouflage-patterned hunting hat that could not be linked to Williams. Officials with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency speculated that Mike had been eaten by alligators, which is why the body could not be found. There were actually quite a few alligators living in the lake. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement found no signs indicating a violent death and agreed with that theory. After five weeks, the search was called off. The day after the search was called off, Denise held a memorial service for Mike, less than two months after the alleged accident. It seemed to everyone that Denise had come to terms with the loss of her husband, but Mike's mother had not. Six months later, in June 2001, an angler discovered wading boots floating in the lake. Divers searched the lake area and retrieved a lightweight hunting jacket and flashlight from the bottom. In one of the jacket's pockets was a hunting license with Williams's name and signature. The find raised many questions. Neither the hunting jacket nor the boots had visible teeth marks indicative of an alligator attack. None of the items found showed signs of having been in the water for six months. The boots were not slimy and the flashlight still worked. However, a week later, Denise's attorney asked the court to declare Mike Williams dead. Based on the items found, he suggested that alligators and other aquatic life had swallowed the body whole. The motion was granted. The death certificate said Mike died on December 16, 2000. Cause of death, accidental drowning while duck hunting on Lake Seminole, 
The body has yet to be recovered. This is how Mike Williams' story might have ended if not for Cheryl Williams, who refused to give up and continued to search for her son. All I know is that I can't stop looking for him until I find him, she said. Cheryl's efforts seriously strained her relationship with her former sister-in-law. Denise demanded she stop searching and accept reality. She said, I'm tired of seeing articles about Mike and his disappearance. I just want to move on with my life. If you keep pushing this investigation, you will never see your granddaughter again. Cheryl couldn't give up on her son, and Denise carried out her threat. If not for the mother's persistence, her son's story might have remained submerged at the bottom of a dark, algae-covered lake. It took Cheryl Williams three years to convince law enforcement officials to open an investigation into her young son's disappearance. I made phone calls, put up signs about my missing son, wrote to the governor of Florida every day, compiled my notes into an evidence book, asked people to post on social media and contacted reporters, Cheryl will tell you years later. The persistent mother contacted Matthew Oresco, an alligator expert. In his response, he explained that alligators do not feed during the cold winter months. Cold weather causes water temperatures to drop, so alligators don't feed in the winter. All they do is maintain their body temperature. 14 degrees is too cold for an alligator to be interested in food at all. Moreover, Oresco wrote that after an alligator kill, there is always forensic evidence left behind. Eventually, after three years, Cheryl Williams convinced law enforcement to drop the ridiculous alligator theory and launch an official investigation into her son's disappearance. The case was reopened because of little-known facts regarding alligators' eating habits. Evidence gathered from interviews and a little official data convinced investigators that Williams' death was no accident. My gut feeling is that Mike did not die in Lake Seminole, and that's the general consensus of all the law enforcement agencies working on this case," said Rami Austin, a former investigator with the 2nd District State's Attorney's Office who prosecuted Mike's case. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Agency initially took over the case because Williams was considered a missing hunter. Officers spent 735 hours searching a 10-acre section of the lake for the body, but didn't spend a minute looking for signs of wrongdoing. Jackson County Sheriff's deputies brought in to help with the search also did not consider other possibilities. Investigators interviewed everyone involved in the search and police officer, David Arnett, who was present at the scene that day, years later said, some things immediately look strange. Williams didn't usually hunt alone. His truck was found in an undeveloped area from which he would have had to drag the boat over mud, not on the nearby concrete boat launch he usually used. A terrible storm that night should have pushed the boat to the east shore, but it was found on the west shore. The boat's motor wasn't running, but it was full of gasoline. If Mike had been driving the boat and fell out of it, it would have continued to float in circles until it ran out of gas. Unfortunately, law enforcement began to doubt too late that they were dealing with a simple drowning. The crime scene had already been trampled by numerous volunteers and searchers. A car that could have served as a clue was taken by the family without any verification. Potential witnesses were missed. Denise Williams and Brian Winchester became suspicious to investigators because they learned that Winchester had divorced his wife, Kathy, and married Denise. They also learned of Denise's unexpected financial gain of nearly $2 million from her late husband's life insurance policy. Detectives determined that it was Winchester who sold the policy to Mike. They also found it strange that Denise, as Mike's wife, did not want to have anything to do with the investigation and tried to prevent Cheryl's activity, even forbidding the grandmother to communicate with her granddaughter. In 2005, the newly married couple were called in for questioning, which gave nothing new to the investigation. Brian provided an alibi for the morning of the disappearance of Mike Williams. He said he was 60 miles from the lake, at home, in bed, as his ex-wife Kathy could attest. He said he had intended to go hunting with his father-in-law in the morning, but overslept. Denise's interrogation also yielded no new leads. In 2008, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement announced that Mike's disappearance was not an accident, and they believe he was the victim of a crime. However, without sufficient evidence, they alas cannot prosecute. We have suspicions, but we need proof. Another investigation failed to find out her son's fate. 
but Cheryl Williams did not give up again. Her efforts led to the Discovery Cable Channel doing a story on Mike's disappearance and subsequent investigations in late 2011. By then, Cheryl had become disillusioned with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, believing it was either incompetent or uninterested in solving the case. Beginning in 2012, Mike's mother wrote about one letter a day to the governor, Rick Scott, asking him to either assign the investigation to another agency or appoint a special prosecutor to do so. Cheryl sent 2,600 letters to the governor over nine years. In 2012, Denise caught Brian cheating and they broke up. The following year, Denise filed for divorce. After a few more years, an appraisal of the former family home was to take place, after which even property issues would no longer bind them. This event was a turning point in Mike's case. Brian didn't want a divorce. Denise didn't want to continue the relationship. They were constantly fighting, and the Williams investigation was poking fun at them. Brian would call Denise, and she stopped returning his calls. He couldn't handle the stress level. On August 5th, 2016, the day a real estate appraisal was due as part of a court order, Denise left her home to drive to work at Florida State University. While talking to her sister on the phone, she saw someone climb over the back seat of her car. It turned out to be Winchester. Brian pressed a loaded gun against Denise's ribs and told her to drive straight ahead. He said he had to do that because she wasn't answering his calls. Denise tried to calm Brian down, agreed with everything he said, and promised to give him a chance to save their marriage. Brian believed it. Denise assured him that she wouldn't go to the police and report what he had just done, and Brian got out of the car. As he got out, he took the brown sheet, plastic sheeting, bleach sprayer, and tools with him. It became clear that Denise had miraculously escaped death. Denise called emergency services. Brian was quickly arrested and charged with kidnapping, which is a first-degree felony in Florida, and carries a life sentence as the maximum penalty. He was also charged with domestic violence and armed burglary. The court decided to keep Brian in custody without bail. Cheryl Williams expressed hope that this development will lead to the solving of her son's disappearance case. Brian is not going to let Denise run around alone with all that money, she told the New York Daily News. I pray that he will tell us what really happened. And Brian did tell, bargaining himself an extremely favorable deal with the prosecutor and avoiding a life sentence. At first, I think we were all doing really well. But I wasn't a good husband, Brian began his story. One day, I found a note in my first wife Kathy's purse and realized she was cheating on me. I wanted revenge. We often went to bars and concerts with Denise and Mike. I had been friends with Denise since high school. I was never really attracted to her. But after Kathy cheated on me, I started looking at other women differently. The affair between Brian and Denise began in October 1997. One time drunken sex at a rock concert quickly escalated to frequent secret meetings. We started meeting at hotels during the workday. We met whenever we had the opportunity. Brian recounted, he did not want to divorce. Denise made it clear that she would never divorce her husband. Public opinion was important to her and she did not want to share custody of her daughter. Over time, the affair became more than just meeting for casual sex. Denise and Brian thought of themselves as a couple, exchanging gifts and love letters. It became clear that they couldn't go on like this. They could not be without each other, and divorce was unacceptable to Denise. Her pious image was not to be harmed. Around this time, Mike almost died in a hunting accident. Brian saved him, and Denise suddenly saw a way out of the situation. After the deal with the prosecutor, Brian will reveal. The year 2000 prompted us to start talking about Mike and Kathy's death. Denise wanted it all on me, not her, and she wanted a scenario where it wasn't a murder, but an accident. She wanted death to be left up to God. That way she could live with it. After considering various options, Brian and Denise settled on a boating accident. In doing so, they timed the murder so that they could get the maximum possible payout on Mike's life insurance policy. They both realized that Mike had to be killed before one of the three policies expired at the end of December 2000. The plan was in place. Brian called his friend to go hunting. He said he'd found a great spot on the shores of Lake Seminole. Mike expected to go there with Brian and return home by noon to celebrate his anniversary with his wife. 
I told him that we were going to go to a special place and that he absolutely had to bring his wading boots with him. I had to make sure he took them with him because it was believed that if you fell overboard in wading boots, you would drown very quickly. The plan was to make death look like an accidental drowning. Once Brian and Mike were in the water, Brian pushed Mike out of the boat, but instead of sinking, he grabbed onto the stumps and began to wade through them to the shore. Brian panicked. I didn't know what to do. Mike started calling loudly for help. I didn't know how to get out of this situation. I had a shotgun. I was panicking and I shot him in the head. I didn't think about what I was doing. Things didn't go according to plan and I needed to cover up what happened. There was hardly any time left. I should have been back home by now and getting ready to go hunting with my father-in-law. No one knew I was at the lake with Mike. So I decided it would be best for me to drive home and pretend like I had overslept. I drove home and hoped that Kathy was still asleep. I entered the house as quietly as I could. Katie was asleep. My phone was on the floor. I went to bed, called my father-in-law, and apologized. Brian did everything he could to create an alibi for himself. Then he hid the body. Denise didn't know that Brian had shot Mike in the head and buried him. Brian tried to tell her, but she didn't want to listen. It was enough for her that her husband was gone. Denise wanted to go on living with the idea that it was God who kept him from swimming out and let him drown. According to Brian, they promised each other that neither of them would ever say anything. Denise and Brian justified what happened by saying that the main reason Mike was killed was because it was impossible for them to live together. We said the money was just the cherry on the cake, Brian would pronounce in court. Investigators learned that it was Brian who planted a hat, boots, flashlight, and license. First, he needed to keep a searchers from leaving a lake, and afterwards, he needed grounds to pronounce Mike dead so Denise could get insurance, since a recognition process usually takes about five years. The lovers managed it in just seven months. Including Social Security and other benefits, Denise received about $2 million. On May 8, 2018, Denise Williams was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory to a felony, which carried a life sentence. Denise pleaded not guilty to all three charges. In February 2019, she was sentenced to life in prison. Five months later, Mike and Denise's daughter, Amsley, received all of her late father's assets and insurance money owed to Denise. In January 2020, Denise Williams appealed the conviction and life sentence. Her attorney argued before Florida's first district court of appeal that there was no evidence that she was involved in committing the murder. In November 2020, the murder conviction was overturned, but the 30-year sentence for conspiracy to commit murder was upheld. Denise is now in custody at the Florida Women's Reception Center. She will be 78 years old when she is released. Brian Winchester was transferred to Madison Correctional Institute in Florida to serve the remainder of his sentence. His current release date is set for July 30th, 2036. He will be 67 years old. Ansley, daughter of Mike and Denise insists her mother is innocent and places the blame on Brian Winchester. She refused to speak to any media regarding the outcome of the case and her personal life. According to Cheryl and Nick, Ansley's uncle, they have not been able to connect with Ansley. Cheryl is very sorry that she has lost not only her son, but also her granddaughter. In the midst of winter, when families gather to celebrate peace and joy, a sinister shadow loomed over the picturesque town of Dover, Arkansas. It was December 1987, a time meant for festivity and love, but for one family, it became a scene of overwhelming horror. This is the chilling tale of the Christmas killer, Ronald Gene Simmons, a man who transformed the season of giving into a time of unspeakable tragedy. But what leads a person to destroy what they once cherished? What darkness lies within the human mind that can turn a father into a monster? From decorated war hero to a man convicted of the worst family massacre in American history, we'll delve into the depths of a mind clouded by secrets and rage, where the line between protector and predator became fatally blurred. To understand the mind behind the massacre, we must journey back to the origins of Ronald Gene Simmons. His story begins not with violence, but with a seemingly ordinary life, marked by service and family. Ronald Gene Simmons was born on July 15, 1940, in Chicago, Illinois. His father died of a stroke when Ronald was three. 
his mother got married again in less than a year to a civil engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who was transferred to Arkansas. Little is known about Simmons' early childhood, but it was a life that took a turn towards discipline and commitment when Ronald dropped out of school and enlisted in the United States Navy in 1957, and later the U.S. Air Force. Simmons served with distinction. Over a 22-year career, he received several commendations, including the Bronze Star Medal, the Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross, and the Air Force Ribbon for Excellent Marksmanship. But behind the facade of a decorated military man, there were undercurrents of turmoil. Simmons married Rebecca Ulibarri in 1960 in New Mexico, and together they had seven children. However, the veneer of a normal family life was shattered in 1981 when allegations emerged that Simmons had been the assaulting his 15-year-old daughter, Sheila, and had fathered a child with her. Fearing prosecution, Simmons uprooted his family, moving them from New Mexico to a desolate 13-acre tract of land in Pope County, 6.5 miles north of Dover, Arkansas, known as Mockingbird Hill. This property, isolated and ringed with a makeshift fence, up to 10 feet tall, became a fortress of sorts, a place where Simmons could exert total control. The residents didn't have a phone or indoor plumbing. But what was it that drove a man of discipline and service to the edge of such darkness? Was it the fear of losing control over his family, the desperation to conceal his illicit acts, or something deeper, a more sinister aspect of his psyche yet to be revealed? The facade of the family man began to crumble revealing a tyrannical figure, ruling his household with an iron fist. The family, once a symbol of joy and unity, became prisoners in their own home. This descent into tyranny was but a prelude to the horror that would unfold, unraveling the chilling transformation of Ronald Gene Simmons from a respected military man to one of the most notorious mass murderers in American history. In November 1979, Simmons retired from the Air Force and military service. He did some low-paying jobs in the nearby town of Russellville, Arkansas. He worked as an accounts receivable clerk at Woodline Motor Freight, but had to resign after multiple reports of inappropriate sexual advances. He worked for about a year and a half at a Sinclair Mini Mart, but had to quit on December 18, 1987, because of low wages. Two of the elder children, Billy and Sheila, had moved out, got married, and started their own families. So by the time of the murders, there were only seven people living in the house. The calm of the holiday season in 1987 was shattered in Dover, Arkansas, by a series of heinous crimes. Ronald Gene Simmons' descent into murderous madness began shortly before Christmas, on December 22nd. The Simmons family home, once a haven of domestic life, turned into a chilling stage for an unthinkable act. Ronald Gene Simmons, armed with a 22 caliber pistol, commenced a killing spree that would become the worst family massacre in American history. His first victims were his wife, 46-year-old Rebecca, an eldest son, 26-year-old Ronald Jr., bludgeoned with a crowbar and shot. And he strangled Ronald Jr.'s daughter and his granddaughter, three-year-old Barbara, their demise was just the beginning. Simmons lay in wait for his other children, feigning a festive spirit, only to mercilessly end their lives, one by one. Later that day, the Dover school bus dropped off the younger kids for their Christmas break from school. In a macabre ritual, Simmons systematically strangled and drowned his younger children, displaying a level of brutality that defies comprehension. The youngest victims, mere toddlers, met a similar fate, their innocence stolen in the most atrocious way. Simmons told them he had gifts for each of them, which he wanted to give one at a time, then strangled them and held under the water in a rain barrel. First to receive her gift was his eldest daughter, 17-year-old Loretta. His three other children, 14-year-old Eddie, 11-year-old Marianne, and 8-year-old Becky were murdered in the same brutal manner. He then dumped the bodies in one of the cesspits he had made his children dig days before. But the horror did not end there. On December 26th, as the rest of the world celebrated, Simmons' remaining family members arrived for a holiday date, unaware of the nightmare that awaited them. 23-year-old Simmons's son, Billy, 
his 21-year-old daughter-in-law Renata and their child were the next to fall victim to his unfathomable rage. Billy and Renata were both shot dead. Their bodies were left by the dining room table next to the decorated Christmas tree with unopened gifts and covered with their own coats and some bedding. Then their 20-month-old son, Trey, was strangled and drowned. The same fate befell his 24-year-old daughter, Sheila, her 33-year-old husband, Dennis, and their children. Simmons strangled his and Sheila's child, six-year-old Sylvia, and finally, his 21-month-old grandson, Michael. The bodies were meticulously laid out, a grim tableau that defied any sense of humanity. He then covered their bodies with coats. Sheila's body was laid on the dining room table and covered with Rebecca Simmons' best tablecloth. He wrapped the bodies of Trey and Michael in plastic sheeting, and they were left in abandoned cars behind the Simmons' home. Simmons then embarked on a chillingly ordinary series of errands, his actions a stark contrast to the carnage he had just inflicted. He drove to a Sears store in Russellville to pick up Christmas gifts previously ordered for his family. That night he went out for a drink at a local bar. When he returned home, he spent the night and the next day drinking beer and watching television surrounded by the dead bodies of his family. On December 28th, the killing spree spilled over into the town of Russellville. In the morning, Simmons drove a car that had belonged to his son, Ronald Jr., to a Walmart in Russellville and purchased a second firearm. Fueled by a mix of revenge and rage, Simmons targeted those he felt had wronged him. The violence was indiscriminate, claiming the lives of acquaintances and strangers alike. His former workplace, a law firm, became the stage for his continued rampage. 24-year-old Kathy Kendrick, a secretary who had rebuffed his advances, was his first victim. She was fatally shot. The brutality continued at the Taylor Oil Company, where he shot and wounded the 38-year-old owner, Russell Taylor, who was also the owner of Sinclair Mitty Mark, from which Simmons had recently resigned. He also killed a complete stranger in the building and shot at another employee before exiting the building, but missed. In Sinclair Mini Mart, Simmons shot and wounded two more people. He then shot his former supervisor, 35-year-old Joyce Butts, twice and wounded her in the office of Woodmine Motor Freight. She survived and testified later that Simmons had yelled at her during a previous argument about wages. The entire rampage lasted 45 minutes. Two people were killed and four wounded. Simmons' final act was as perplexing as it was chilly. He said to the secretary in Woodline Motor Freight, I just wanted to kill Joyce, just Joyce. I've gotten everybody who wanted to hurt me. Simmons surrendered to police without resistance, his spree of violence concluding as abruptly as it had begun. But the most heinous of his crimes were yet to be discovered. Simmons sat silently in his cell and stared at the wall. He refused to speak to investigators or even his attorneys. He didn't say a word during the interrogation. But when he was asked about his family, Simmons' eyes got red and started to well up. His lips started to quiver. The police got suspicious. They couldn't reach his family, so two officers drove to the isolated home. The investigation began on the chilling grounds of the Simmons family home. Here, detectives encountered a scene that defied belief family members' bodies laid out with a chilling meticulousness. It was a tableau that spoke volumes about the mindset of the killer. In the aftermath of this unprecedented massacre, questions swirled. What drove a father, a husband, a war veteran to commit such unspeakable acts against his own family and community? And what can we learn from this tragedy to prevent such horrors in the future? In the wake of the horrific murders committed by Ronald Gene Simmons, law enforcement faced the daunting task of piecing together a puzzle that spanned both family tragedy and public rampage. As the probe widened to include Simmons' subsequent attacks in Russellville, the challenge for investigators was to understand the connection between the family murders and the seemingly random acts of violence that followed. The evidence gathered was overwhelming. Firearms, Witness testimonies and Simmons' own actions painted a picture of a man who, after committing an unspeakable act against his own family, 
sought to extend his vengeance to those he perceived had wronged him in the wider community. In a case that stunned even seasoned investigators, the question wasn't just who had committed these crimes, but why. What drives a man to annihilate his family and lash out at the world around him? The arrest of Ronald Gene Simmons brought an end to the immediate threat, but it was just the beginning of a quest for justice and understanding. The prosecution's task was to unravel the mind of Simmons, to present a narrative that could make sense of the senseless. As the investigation progressed, more disturbing details emerged. Allegations of abuse, control, and a life led under the tyranny of Simmons became the focus. Each piece of evidence added another layer to the dark portrait of a man who had lived a life of deception and brutality. In the courtroom, the full extent of his crimes would come to light, bringing some answers, but also leaving haunting questions about the nature of evil. What kind of man lurked behind the annihilation of his family and terrorizing a community? Simmons' life was marked by strict discipline and control, traits honed during his military career. But beneath the surface of this structured exterior lay a tumultuous inner world. Allegations of sexual assault within his family suggest deep-seated pathological behavior. Experts in criminal psychology often point to a history of abuse, either experienced or perpetrated as a significant factor in the development of violent behavior. In Simmons' case, the blurring of boundaries within his own family, coupled with a need for dominance, may have contributed to his downward spiral. The isolation of the Simmons family at Mockingbird Hill paints a picture of a man intent on exerting absolute control. This isolation could have exacerbated existing mental health issues, creating a pressure cooker environment. What then triggered Simmons to turn to murder? The possibility of his wife seeking a divorce might have been the tipping point, challenging his authoritarian hold over his family. She had already tried to leave him on numerous occasions, but always returned. A family friend informed the police that Simmons' wife had been saving up money to divorce him when the murder happened. Simmons' wife had written to their son shortly before the killings. I don't want to live the rest of my life with dad. I am a prisoner here and the kids too. Every time I think of freedom, I want out as soon as possible. Simmons' actions in Russellville suggest a broader rage directed not just at his family, but at anyone he perceived as a threat or who had rejected him. His targeting of individuals in the community indicates a blend of personal vendetta and displaced aggression. Yet the absence of any recorded mental illness diagnosis leaves us with more questions than answers. The depths of Simmons' mind remain, in many ways, a locked enigma. Could this tragedy have been averted? In exploring these questions, we confront the unsettling reality of how little we sometimes know about those closest to us. After the chilling massacre by Ronald Gene Simmons, the wheels of justice began to turn, bringing us to a courtroom where the grim details of his crimes would be laid bare. After a psychiatric evaluation, it was determined that he was sane and capable to stand trial. Simmons' trial was a focal point of national attention, a legal battle to seek justice for the unprecedented atrocity he had committed. The proceedings were swift, reflecting the urgency of a community seeking closure. In May 1988, Simmons stood trial for the murders outside his family, specifically the killings of Kathy Kendrick and Jim Chaffin. The evidence presented was overwhelming, leaving little doubt about Simmons' guilt. Simmons, who had acted with such brutality, now faced the consequences of his actions in a court of law. His demeanor in court was reported as defiant, a stark contrast to the calculated coldness of his crimes. On May 12, 1988, the verdict was delivered. Ronald Gene Simmons was found guilty and sentenced to death by lethal injection, plus 147 years. Remarkably, Simmons himself requested that no appeal be made on his behalf, saying, to those who oppose the death penalty. In my particular case, anything short of death would be cruel and unusual punishment. Because of this, he had to be separated from other prisoners on death row. His life was in danger as they believed Simmons' refusal to appeal his death sentence was jeopardizing their prospects of escaping their own executions. 
The second trial for the murders of his 14 family members began in February 1989. Here, the prosecution delved into the harrowing details of the family massacre, painting a picture of a man driven by control and rage. During the trial, a shocking moment unfolded. Simmons lashed out in court, punching the prosecutor and attempting to seize a deputy's gun, an act that only outed to his infamy. This happened after Simmons' letter to his daughter Sheila was introduced, in which Simmons said, You have destroyed me, and you have destroyed my trust in you. I will see you in hell. After she had disclosed that he was her child's father to the police, on February 10th, 1989, Simmons was found guilty of 14 counts of capital murder. The judge, undeterred by Simmons' outburst, handed down another death sentence. This rapid succession from trial to sentence was unprecedented, reflecting the severity of the crimes. The execution warrant for Simmons was signed by Arkansas Governor and later President Bill Clinton on May 31, 1990. All visitors, including legal counsel and clergy, were refused by Simmons. On June 25th, he died via the fatal injection method he had chosen in the Cummins unit. This was the shortest period from sentence to execution to death in U.S. history since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. His last words were, justice delayed finally be done is justifiable homicide. Nobody claimed his body, and he was buried in a common grave in Lincoln County, Arkansas. As we reflect on the legal proceedings against Ronald Gene Simmons, we are left to ponder the balance between justice and understanding. The case of Ronald Gene Simmons is a stark reminder of the potential for hidden dangers within our own homes, and it's crucial to recognize early warning signs. FBI profilers and psychologists suggest vigilance for certain behaviors, patterns of control, isolation, and abuse within a family. These can often be precursors to more violent actions. In cases like Simmons, where the perpetrator isolates the family, the intervention of external agencies becomes critical. Neighbors, friends, and relatives need to be attentive and proactive in reporting any suspicions. But perhaps the most profound lesson lies in understanding the human psyche. Simmons' case demonstrates the complex interplay of psychological factors that can lead to such extreme behavior. What led Ronald Gene Simmons to commit such heinous acts? The answer lies in a complex web of control, abuse, and psychological instability. His desire for dominance, coupled with deep-seated issues likely stemming from his abusive behavior within the family, set the stage for tragedy. Simmons' military discipline juxtaposed with his chaotic personal life created a volatile mix. The isolation and control he exerted over his family only fueled his capacity for violence. And when his authority was threatened, possibly by a looming divorce, it may have been the catalyst for the massacre. John Harris, one of Simmons' defense attorneys said of his abused family, I think he felt like they are going to take him out. He's going to take them out first. I think that was his mindset. Could anything have been done to prevent the carnage? In hindsight, the warning signs were there. Isolation, abuse, and a man teetering on the edge. Timely intervention could perhaps have altered this tragic course. Simmons' story is a grim reminder that behind closed doors, within seemingly normal families, the seeds of tragedy can grow unnoticed. People feared him even back then in New Mexico. They said he was strange, unfriendly, antisocial. He didn't have much to say. A friend of his daughter's said, he had a beer in his hand all the time. He had one little room he would stay in all the time. It was dark and seemed spooky and it stunk. Attorney John Harris also said that there was more than one person to blame. If authorities had successfully arrested him back in 1981 on the basis of his daughter's sexual assault, the murders likely wouldn't have happened. However, Prosecutors at the time said they had dropped the charges at the family's request. Ronald Gene Simmons' Christmas week killing spree is the worst mass murder committed by a single person in Arkansas history. What were the underlying reasons that made Simmons annihilate his whole family that once formed the core of his identity? Tell me in the comments.